I'm going to be talking about depression, where we've been and where we are now. It's a little bit of a personal journey. Um, um, I have some conflicts. Uh, you've been generous enough to support my travel getting here. Um, I have some money through the National Institutes of Mental Health, which uh, I will be referring to as I give you this talk, as well as some uh, money from uh, another funding agency. This is one of my favorite quotes, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it, so keep it in mind as I talk. Okay, another thing that I'm gonna ask you to do, I I'm glad you made it here after lunch. Uh, I hope you won't fall asleep. Um, it's a tough time to talk. Anyway, I've got red slides and blue slides. There's no politics for those of you from the United States, no politics intended here. Um, red slides are referring to things that we thought in the past or data that we got in the past, whereas blue is, is current information. <clears throat> so I'm going to be covering the epidemiology of child and adolescent depression, phenomenology about episode duration and recurrence, why we thought depression didn't exist, relevance of adverse events. Uh, I'll talk about masked depression. I don't know. <clears throat> if that's a concept that you younger generation are familiar with, but I'll try to familiarize you with it. Comorbidity, irritability, longitudinal course, and treatment implications. So just by way of review, major depressive disorder then and now reflects on an unhappy or irritable mood, uh, motivation without interest or energy, your thinking is affected in your pessimistic, constricted, and indecisive. Uh, it affects your body in terms of sleep and appetite change. You have feelings about yourself that are warped because you're depressed. You feel worthless, guilty, and better off dead. Um, and the feelings last most of the day, more days than not, for weeks and months. So the relevant questions about depression 40 or, uh, 40 or 50 years ago was, does childhood depression exist? Can it exist? If it exists, is it a psychiatric disorder? If it's a psychiatric disorder, is it similar to adult depression, or is there a version unique to children? And the unique version might be this masked depression or depressive equivalence, and I'll explain that. Um, if we treat behavior problems, does the depression go away? Or does treating, is it necessary to treat the depression for the other problems to go away. And the clue is, when we started out in the childhood depression business, our hope was that second thing, that in fact, if we could treat and treat successfully children with depression, that we would save them the misery of growing up to become um, depressed adults or to have other problems that happen when you've had a chronic mental illness. So we very fervently hoped that finding childhood depression and treating it would basically be a huge um, uh, advance in terms of child mental health. And then how do we understand treatment response? Okay, red slide, okay? So why clinicians didn't think depression existed in the 1960s and 70s? Well, this is important. If you read Slater and Roth, who had a major textbook at the time, 1967, what you'd read is depressive reactions were apparently rare in children, at least in the form seen in adults. Psychoanalytic theory held that depression doesn't exist because of the immature ego that doesn't have the defenses to become melancholic. There was a developmental perspective that said depression exists, but appears different from depression in adults. And this is where the mask depression depress depressive equivalents come in. Depressive feelings in a growing child are displaced by behavior problems, and those are called depressive equivalents. There was another viewpoint as well. It said depressive symptoms are common in children, but they're brief and not clinically significant. Quote, the syndrome of childhood depression rests largely on surmise. So those were kind of what we were living with back in, well, the 1960s is before my time, but the 60s, 70s, and, and uh, early 80s. So in terms of epidemiology, one of the projects that I was involved in fairly early in my career 
Uh, Javad Kashani was one of the early epidemiologists in this area, and he worked with the Dunedin sample, little known fact, because that's grown to be such a huge and important study. Anyway, he found a point prevalence for depression, major depressive disorder in children at the age of nine of about 2%. In terms of adolescence, he found a, a rate, one-year rate of any depression or dysthymia about 8%, and we found a rate of bipolar disorder of about 0.7%. But when we did that study, we, got, we required the information to jibe between parent and teen. In other words, it wasn't just the teenager that was asked, it wasn't just the parent that was asked, we needed to put the information together. So fast forward to the present. Uh, in our lab, the Stony Brook um, Temperament Study, uh, and this paper is in press, we found a lifetime uh, 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 nine-year prevalence, no, the age nine prevalence of depression to be about 2.3%, which is frankly close enough for government work in terms of the 1.8%. So think of depression in, in school-age children of about 2%, one child in every two classrooms. Kathleen Marikangas uh, with the uh, National Comorbidity Study for Adolescents um, only had information from the adolescent, not child and adolescent like Kashani and I had. Um, she found rates of depression of close to 12% and a higher rate of bipolar disorder, but bipolar spectrum disorder, which she found 2.6% of bipolar 1 and 2. Again, just, ask, uh, just having the teen informant. We've known for quite a long time that there's a difference in the rates at different ages. So preschool children and school-age children, the rates are really low. Uh, by the time you get to the later end of latency, you're talking about the rates that I was telling you about, and the rates continue to climb with adolescence. So there are some interesting measurement issues that we've not really solved. We understand, and, and these two studies are huge studies. They are studies of, well, 78,000 kids in one case, 45,000 in another. Um, these are not, you know, you're not knocking on doors and asking people questions in, in these particular surveys because they are surveys, but nevertheless, the findings are still important. So six to 11-year-olds, the rates are, again, are around 2%. And in the same study, when you look at 12 to 17-year-olds, what you see is, the rates go up. Well, no duh, we know that. Interestingly, though, that's parent report. When you look at the teen report, you see the teen report is almost twice the parent report. And then another thing happens if you just look at the parent report. The famous gender difference that we have isn't there. So if your parent is giving information about you, the parent will notice more depression in the, chi uh, the child as he or she becomes an adolescent, but there's no gender difference. Where you get the gender difference is when you talk to the child, him or herself, and by child in this case, I mean child or adolescent. So what you see is that there is definitely a difference in terms of a parent report and teen report, not only in frequency, but also in gender difference. And so the question is, why is that? Is it, women, is it we women, do we, are, do we recognize our feelings better? Do the boys suppress it better? Are we drama queens, we women, and so we whine more, and, and so we sound more depressed when people ask? Uh, it, but I don't think I was ever aware of the fact that that gender difference was only from the teen report. You don't see it in the parent report. And I'm gonna come back to that uh, about observer report at the end of this talk. Okay, well, so now we've got established the fact that if you ask about depression, you find that it exists, but we didn't answer the question yet, is it a transient phenomenon? Is there impairment uh, associated with it? Because Lefkowitz and Burton said, yeah, 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 kids can get depressed, but it doesn't mean anything. So Marika Kovacs um, did a very elegant study, and she looked at what everybody was interested in at the time is, what are the duration of episodes of depression? How frequently do they recur? Do they relapse? Do you get other episodes? 
And what she found was that when you meet criteria for depression using standardized interviews, the episodes can last well over six months, seven to nine months. They remit, the episodes remit, but it may take a couple of years. A, a, a not insignificant kids, bunch of kids were chronically depressed. And this was pretty similar to what the adult depressive researchers were finding. What was different was that there were rates of mania much higher in the follow-ups of her depressed sample than there were in the follow-ups of the depressed sample in adults. So 6% is what people were observing in adult studies converting to bipolar, whereas Dr. Kovacs found that somewhere between 20 and 25%, depending on if you were talking bipolar one or two, developed a manic or hypomanic episode after a first or second episode of depression as a child. So there were some differences. There are other adverse outcomes too. Suicide, drug and alcohol problems, social impairment, school dropout, and adult depression. So the bottom line is depression wasn't transient. Generally speaking, episodes remit and recur. Mania conversion is higher than in adults. So now fast forward. 20 some odd years, 24 year follow up. And what happens in the, in the sample of kids that Dr. Kovacs found initially? Well, she's found that they've continued to have episodes, that those episodes um, have pretty long durations as they recur. The first one was uh, nine months, the second one was seven months, the third one was six months. She goes on for a few more episodes. Anyway, the episodes get shorter with time. There are three to four years between episodes. Unfortunately, and this is of course what we're all looking for, we're looking for predictors. Who's gonna have new episodes? Who's gonna get well and stay well? And she didn't find any. There were no predictors of recovery or recurrence. And that includes our favorite risk factors like age of onset and family history. And so that was kind of disappointing. The, the finding about bipolar disorder remained pretty stable. 12% had developed over the course of time. Um, mania or bipolar one, 14% had developed hypomania or bipolar two, and most of the people that switched had switched early on. So this is consistent with the findings I told you last slide. And there have been a number of, of longitudinal studies that have gone on since. I just mentioned the Oregon Adolescent Depression Study because my colleague Dan Klein has been involved in that. And they find that by age uh, 30, 58% of the, of the teens in their sample had at least one recurrence and 10% had more than four episodes of major depression. So not a trivial condition when you find it. Now what about this form seen in adults business? There's a reason that I highlighted that. So what was the form seen in adults back in 1959? Heinz, Heinz Lehmann was a prominent psychiatrist at the time and he described primary symptoms of depression as a sad, despairing mood, decrease in mental productivity and reduced drive, uh, motor retardation or agitation, feelings of hopelessness, hypochondriacal preoccupations, depersonalization, et cetera all of our friendly depressive symptoms, in addition to which there were, if you got really severely depressed, nihilistic delusions, paranoid delusions, hallucinations, and suicidal rumination. So this was the form seen in adults. The form seen in adults has been argued about for the better part of 60 or 70 years. It can be called endogenous, it can be called melancholic, but the features in common with this are unremitting apprehension or morbidity, non-reactive mood, pervasive anhedonia, slowed thought movements and speech. If psychosis is present, nihilistic delusions, feelings of hopelessness, guilt, sin, and ruin. And the melancholic subtype, same thing. Loss of pleasure in almost everything, non-reactive mood, a distinct quality of depressed mood, depression worse in the morning, significant anorexia or weight loss. I'm here to tell you guys, you don't see that in children. You just don't see it in children. Now, you can in adolescence. In this case, I'm making a distinction. But having 
run or overseen inpatient units for most of my academic career and seen children be admitted looking as sad and morose as anything you've ever seen and then watch them 15 minutes later on the inpatient unit where they're running around like wild Indians, that pervasive, unremitting, grinding depression that you see in adults doesn't seem to occur with any, I mean, it, it can occur occasionally, but it's not the, the common variety of depression that you see in kids. What do you see? Well, there's this wonderful quote from Robert Burton in The Anatomy of Melancholy, 1621, also before my time. Bad parents, stepmothers, to, not according to my kids, bad parents, stepmothers, tutors, masters, teachers too rigorous or too severe or too remiss or indulgent on the other side are often fountains and furthers of this disease. Parents and such as have the tuition and oversight of children offend many times in that they're too stern, always threatening, chiding, brawling, whipping, or striking, by means of which their poor children are so disheartened and cowed that they never have any courage or a merry hour in their lives or take pleasure in anything. Others, again, in the other extreme, do as much harm. Too much indulgence causeth the like. Many fond mothers especially dote so much on their children, like Aesop's ape, until the end they crush them to death. So that's what we see in kids. So when does this start, this depression thing? Well, there have been a number of studies of preschool depression. Um, again, the Stony Brook Temperament Study, which follows a, a, a sample of community children. We're up to age 15 now, but it started at age three. Uh, we found rates were pretty low in preschool. And here's the, here's the part that's interesting. So we've now followed them up, at least in the data that we're publishing, through age 12. The kids that we pick up in the community sample at age three are not those people who are depressed at age six, or at age nine, or at age 12. And if you look at the kids at age 12 who are depressed, and, and we do find them, they weren't the ones that were depressed at age three. So in a community sample, the predictive diagnostic validity of depression may not be there. But there is something that is there. Because when you look at those children at age 12, kids who have had depression at age 3 were not functioning as well as their non-depressed non at age 3 counterparts, and at age, nor were they at age 6. So there's some longitudinal functional impairment that that age three and age six depression might have signaled, but it isn't depression. That's different, this is a community sample, that's different from a clinical sample. Javad and I many years ago found about 1% of 1,000 kids referred to a, basically an inpatient unit, except it was a day unit in Missouri. We found about 1% of those kids had clinical depression. Joan Luby, you may be familiar with her work at Washington University, has, has oversampled depression in preschoolers to, do, uh, to, to find out what happens with those kids. And about 20% of them remain chronically depressed, okay? Some recover, but unlike the community sample of kids, this clinic sa sample of kids is really remains depressed and, and clinically so. Over half of them had depression in later childhood. But here's the interesting part. The predictors were preschool conduct disorder and unsupportive parenting. So what about the stressful life events business? Remember that Burton quote that I read you before. Preschool onset depression and conduct disorder predict school-age depression, both of them, behavior problems and depression. Non-supportive parenting and a high ACEs, the uh, you know, uh, adverse childhood experiences set of symptoms, um, influence depression severity. The mechanism is felt to be that the ACEs provoke hypervigilance to threat, a focus on immediate gratification over future reward, poor emotion regulation, and decreased emotional awareness. And in fact, when you look at this population of 
of in, intractable preschool depressed kids, there do seem to be some imaging findings. Um, Dr. Luby and her colleagues find inferior frontal gyrus may be specifically associated. So that there are biological markers in the clinical but not community sample. What are some of the other predictors of depression onsetting in childhood or adolescence or young adulthood? Well, poverty. Poverty never helped anybody, okay? So poverty is a predictor of depression regardless of the age of onset. Loss and violence is a predictor regardless of age of onset. But some other things are more predictive of a particular age. So lifetime parent psychopathology, maltreatment, and family dysfunction in childhood predicts childhood depression, but not necessarily adolescent or young adult depression. Adolescent maltreatment and family dysfunction predicts adolescent onset. And those things in young adulthood also predict young adult onset. So we do find themes of poverty and loss and violence having cross-age predictions, but there are also um, specific age predictors. So the tentative conclusion is, as Burton noted, children can manifest psychological distress in distressing circumstances. Children meet criteria for depression. Their distress isn't melancholic depression as it had been understood for many years. The challenge has been trying to capture the essence of melancholic or endogenous depression. Is it a difference of type or a difference of degree? People are still rolling on the floor and kicking where it hurts about that. Um, and um, what has changed is that much of what we call depression in children and adults is this response to distress. And this is not a trivial problem. So going back to our depressive equivalents, James Toulon in 1962 sort of outlined that. He said, well, you, the, the young child gets depressed. He develops behavior problems. These are temper tantrums. These are the depressive equivalents now. Temper tantrums, disobedience, truancy, running away from home, accident proneness, self-destructive behavior. Kid's in trouble all the time. He gets convinced that he's bad, evil, and unacceptable. And of course, the worse he feels, the worse he acts. Um, he becomes antisocial. He feels stupid and inferior, ugly and stupid. And all of those things are sort of considered evidence of depression. So that's why they were called depressive equivalents. Well, so this is kind of where I entered the field. Um, the K Award that uh, Mikhail mentioned um, that sort of got me into research. What we did, what I did, was um, take a look at 102 kids uh, referred to our clinic at UCLA. Um, I used the Rudder interview, which was what was available at the time. Kim Pugentic was just developing the kitty sads, and Marika was developing uh, the instrument that she used. People kind of everywhere were recognizing how important it was to, to interview kids and parents in a systematic way. So what I found in my sample was that about a third of the sample were depressed. In those days, being a Washington University uh, trained person, we thought of things as primary versus secondary. And this doesn't mean so much as the, you know, the responsibility of it, but rather what thing happened first. So if you get depressed first, and then develop other problems afterwards. It's called a primary depression. If you had other problems first and then you got depressed, it was called a secondary depression. So of the people that we, I found that were depressed, half were primary, half were secondary. And the, of those people with a secondary depression, half of them had behavior disorders. And so what I want to bring to your attention is the di difference in those two groups. Because the primary depressed people were more acute, they had behavior problems, but they weren't as severe as the kids with a secondary depression who were more chronic and their behavior problems were worse. All met criteria for depression, but the first inkling that that other condition, that comorbidity, may make a difference. And enter irritability. I mean, irritability is sort of the, pa the buzzword these days. Everybody is really into irritability and trying to understand it. And so it, I was actually kind of amused to see that I was interested in irritability many years before it was popular. And what I found was that when I asked kids about 
feeling irritable and ask them about their tempers and fighting and you know if they thought their tempers were short and troublesome. The kids with the primary depression had less irritability than the kids with the depression and the behavior disorder. So it was like two thirds, that the, the, the rates were about six to nine in terms of the rates of irritability. So comorbidity, that's what we call this now. Depression is masked by behavior disorders like ADHD, ODD, and conduct disorder. And it probably comes from the symptom of irritability. Irritability is one of those cross-cutting concepts that encompasses mood and behavior. You see irritability in oppositional defiant disorder in the symptom of gets angry easily. You see it in conduct disorder because these kids are often reactively aggressive. Um, and you see it in ADHD where they have a low frustration tolerance and problem with emotion regulation. So irritably depressed kids are going to bring in those other conditions in which irritability is an important symptom. One of the things that I think is really important about irritability, though, is that there's two components of it. There's how you feel, and that gets captured in interviews and things like, um, do you get angry? You know, how bad is your temper? Do you feel resentful and, and annoyed? Um, in the depression module of the kitty sads, do you have a subjective feeling of being angry, cranky, irritable, et cetera? That's how you feel. But there's also what you do. And so in the Kappa, for instance, you not only talk about, yes, he's, I feel like I have a bad temper, it's do you, re you know, are you snappy? Do you shout? Do you, you know, get into arguments with people? In the kitty sads, do you shout, lose your temper, and have uncontrollable tantrums? There are scales, like the overt aggression scale modified, where they quantify the amount of behavior you emit when you become irritable, like are you verbally aggressive, are you, are you physically aggressive, and how irritable do you feel? For anybody that's out there doing research on irritability, I implore you, take apart the feeling from the behavior, because I can assure you, emergency rooms, at least in the United States, are not filled with children who say, oh, rats! I can't watch TV tonight, or phooey, I can't be on my computer. They're filled with kids in the emergency room who take shovels to their parents' heads when they don't get what they want. So it's the behaviors that are getting them into trouble, not just their irritable mood. And so it's important to take those things apart. So in a recent study, um, Argyris Stringaris did kind of the same thing that I did in 1980. He looked at depressed, irritable kids as opposed to just depressed, alone kids, and finds higher rates of comorbid oppositional defiant disorder and higher rates of conduct disorder. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, higher rates of conduct disorder. Well, I guess I can't get that. Anyway, so depression and irritability, the relation to stress starts fairly young. So what we see is in nursery school, children whose parents said they were depressed had a number of characteristic simple symptoms. In the community sample, the kids with depressive symptoms were more irritable and angry, uncooperative and hyperactive, and had more adverse events. So we're seeing this theme come along where depression, irritability, and adverse events is associated with early depressive symptoms. Same thing is true in the clinical sample. Kids who are ir irritable preschool kids or depressed preschool kids are irritable and sulking. M significant number live in broken homes, more live in broken homes. They've been abused or severely neglected. So just like Burton said, really bad things happen to you, you get depressed. Uh, Dr. Luby's lab has has followed up a, her sample looking at irritability and looking at it uh, in sort of a latent class analysis in three groups, kids who were never irritable, kids who were irritable and then got better, and kids who were irritable and stayed irritable. What she finds, or what their lab finds, is 
the people with a high irritability always have the most mental illness compared to the other two groups. But when you look at the high, the high irritable people with all four comorbidities, you find a whopping over half of the kids that are chronically irritable meeting criteria for all four conditions. So irritability equals comorbidity. The more irritable you are and the longer you are irritable, the more comorbid conditions you have. Now, it's kind of interesting. Dr. Stringaris also was talking about mechanisms from ir for irritability. The child's demand isn't met, and rather than sort of accepting it gracefully, um, the kid either feels like you're um, frustrating him, and so he becomes unglued, or he has what's called aberrant threat processing, meaning that he's looking at this as a much more catastrophic event than it really is. So because he's perceiving this as a catastrophic event or extremely frustrating, he mounts an angry response equal to what his brain thinks is happening. And so he gets really angry, and then his parents get really angry, and then either the parent gives in or the kid gives up or whatever, they have this horrible interaction, and this is supposed to be the mechanism of irritability. Well, for those of us who've been around for a long time, we also recognize this as the same mechanism that Jerry Patterson talked about in the 1970s and 80s and his lab more recently, as the mechanism for understanding coercive family processing that underpins behavior disorders. So interestingly enough, same mechanism, slightly different label. These are two studies that have gone on in uh, the United Kingdom, and they're, by comparison, old. But again, they're looking at depression or depression and comorbid behavior disorders, and Richard Harrington uh, is H, and Eric von Bonn is F. And the point is they did somewhat similar things, so that's why I have them stacked up this way. But what you can see is the people with comorbid conduct disorder and depression have higher rates of irritability, uh, higher rates of being chronically ill, um, and they have more family psychopathology and more, suicide, more suicidality and less anxiety. And over time, when you do a follow-up, and the follow-up has gone on like till the people are in their 30s, you find, again, not surprisingly, the people with MDD and conduct disorder have higher rates of antisocial behavior, and they have less likelihood of recovering. They have more uh, problems with other um, conditions, Brocay syndrome, which is like somatoform disorder. They have more drug use, more lifetime suicide events, more likely not to be working. So the combination of depression and behavior disorders is a much worse combination than depression alone. How about over the long term? And this is, this is what I think is really interesting in, in Dr. Kovacs' follow-up study. When she followed these kids, people up now to their mid-30s, what she found was 78% of the time was spent in the comorbid disorder. 29% was in the depressive episode. So what was carrying the water of their impairment was the comorbidity. The depression didn't help, it came and went, but the comorbid condition remained. And there have been similar studies looking at the same sort of thing. What's the relationship between the behavior problem and the depression? Does the depression cause the behavior problem, or does the behave, do people with behavior problems get depressed? Well, P.S., the story is that, that, that people who have conduct disorders get depressed, but the people who have depression don't develop conduct disorder. So it sounds like the behavior disorder is really driving the problem, not the depression. How about treatment? Turn back the clock, 1960s at the time, 23 published studies, imipramine versus something else, only five failed to be statistically significant. 65% of people improved versus 31% uh, of controls. Amipramine was felt to be effective in depressed patients with psychotic and retarded features, PS melancholic depressives, um, and there was a schizoaffective group that had some response. 
there was clearly a placebo response, and those were mostly the people with what they called neurotic depression. So fast forward to a meta-analysis this past year, or this past spring, and you can see there were even more depressive compounds than I put in the slide. The bottom line is there are now 544 double-blind studies of over 100,000 people, and basically the standard mean difference of response is 0.3 between drug and placebo. Not a rave review, I might add, but the fact is it's still better than nothing. This is in adults. How about in kids? Well, Eva Frommer, also in the United Kingdom in the late 60s, she did a crossover trial, ahead of her time here, between phenylzine and phenobarbitone in children 9 to 15 who had phobic or depressive symptoms. Phenylzine was better than phenobarbitone, but look at how she described her kids. Weepy, irritable, had temper outbursts, some displayed seriously antisocial behavior, a few complained of actually being depressed, and one boy made suicidal threats. More came from emotionally deprived homes or had been upset by death or loss in other ways of both parents. The subjects did not look melancholic. They had multiple comorbidities and depressive equ equivalents, and most of them came from stressful life circumstances. Kim Pujantic in 1978, and again, as I'm telling you, back in the day, we were really hoping that we would be able to give these depressed kids a tricyclic antidepressant and clean them up nice. He did an open trial, and six out of eight were responders. Unfortunately, when he did it double blind, it didn't pan out. So over the course of the 12 or more studies, Phil Hazel, who may even be in the audience, uh, did a meta-analysis back then and found over 12 randomized placebo-controlled trials. Nada, okay? We did not find that tricyclic antidepressants beat placebo in kids. The samples were interesting, though. If you looked at the samples of children who got into the studies of tricyclics, the, the samples were not terribly large. The kids were chronically depressed and had many comorbidities. This was the nail in the coffin study that was done, um, published in 2001. Um, it's a comparison of paroxetine and mipramine and placebo, but what I wanted to bring to your attention was, this was a decent sized sample of a mipramine compared to placebo. And as you can see, whether you look at the reduction in the Hamilton depression score, which was the primary outcome measure used at the time, or the clinical global impression score, the, the placebo response was practically the same as the amipramine response. Well, um, at this point, there have been a number of meta-analyses that have been done. This is the re a fairly recent one done in the kids' studies. We're up to 34 trials, certainly not 544. We have a standardized mean difference of 0.5, actually slightly better than in adults. Um, if you use the clinical global impression score, actually six studies have been positive. All were SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. None of the SSRI trials have been positive. In a meta-analysis that's now a little bit old by Jeff Bridge, what we find is that um, response is always better than remission. There's about a 10% difference between the two. But what I really want you to look at is those two circles over there. And that's the child group, the adolescent group, and the adult group. What you see is the response to the, the depression response is about the same in all three groups. What's different is the placebo response. In the kids, the placebo response rate is high enough so that it is not a statistically significant difference compared to the drug. Well, again, back when I was trying to figure out life, I was going to do the definitive study looking at which of these two things was more important, the depression or the behavior disorder. And so on the inpatient unit that I was overseeing at the time, where we kept kids in those days for quite a long time, we randomized a sample of kids to receive, an, in a, um, a crossover way, placebo, methylphenidate, dizipramine, 
or the combination. And my hope was that the depressed kids would respond to the dizipramine, the methylphen that the, the uh, behavior disordered kids would respond to methylphenidate, and the comorbid kids would respond to both. I was not very sophisticated, and I didn't realize I would need a sample size that was as big as the audience. Um, but we had enough kids to show a couple of things. The first was that, oh, I had the nurses blind to what was going on. They did re depressive ratings. We had people doing, we had a psychologist doing the children's depression rating scale, which is an interview scale. We had the kids doing the children's depression inventory. We did not see a placebo response with the nurse observers, okay? No placebo response there. We had a placebo response with the kids, well, we had a placebo, oh, there we go. We had a placebo response in children who were interviewed, and we had a placebo response in the kids who filled out the depression rating scales themselves. So that says to me that there is something about the interview process of the person himself or herself that accounts for some of that measurement problem because an outsider looking at those kids did not find that same placebo response that, that other people had. The other thing that we found was that in fact, the biggest impact on mood came from methylphenidate. So that when we help the kids with their ADHD and mood dysregulation, that actually had a bigger impact on how depressed they looked than any of the depressive combinations that we had. So how about irritability and ADHD and de uh, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, which is our current DSM-5 uh, condition that em uh, encompasses irritability and uh, depressed um, um, irritability and explosive behavior. If you follow up teens with ADHD, you find out that they have higher rates of depression in adulthood. So 25% of people got depressed without ADHD. Those people who had ADHD first, almost half of them developed depression. If you look at people with disruptive behavior disorders, they consistently predict depressive development, and the, the underpinning thing probably is emotion dysregulation. If you treat the ADHD, methylphenidate decreases ADHD and depression scores, and there's a correlation between those two things. Methylphenidate treatment decreases depressive disorder in Hmong youths with ADHD. ADHD treatment increases survival time to depressive development, more traumatic events decreases time. And ADHD is an independent risk factor for suicide attempts and repeated suicide attempts. And long-term methylphenidate treatments have significantly decreased the, re the rate of repeated suicide attempts. So I'm not telling you that <clears throat> treating ADHD or methylphenidate solves all the problems. But I am saying that if we have a mechanism to treat the comorbidity, it may go a long way to help the depression. So what we've learned in our four decades are that once systematic assessments were developed, adult DSM-3 criteria for depression could be applied to children. Depression in children has some developmental features, like the change, <clears throat> changing gender ratio, high rates of irritability. Placebo response may be a measurement issue. Depressive equivalents are comorbidities. True melancholia is rare in children. Depressed children are similar to depressed adults in many regards. There's high rates of psychosocial adversities and stresses and family histories of depression. Depression in childhood is very serious. It's chronic, recurrent, functionally impairing. It disrupts development and often persists into adulthood. But comorbid disorder may account for impairment too. Treatment may not work as well as we'd like because we aren't adequately addressing the comorbid disorder. Whoa, three seconds to go. So much of what we know or knew about the syndrome of depression and the course of the disorder may not be, de may not be based on the depression, but on the nature and the extent of concurrent conditions. <clears throat> 
As Karen and Rudder noted in 1991, we may have misattributed to depression some of the characteristics and correlations that more accurately concern the coexisting conditions. And by way of thanks, these are the people that I owe a lot to. That's for those of you who might have known him, Dr. Dennis Cantwell, uh, Dr. Kim Pujantic, Javad Kashani, Marika Kovacs, and my current collaborator, Dan Klein. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat>